one point in the movie Minority Report, the lead character, Chief John Anderton, is on the run. He needs to change his identity. But he can't, at least not easily, because the central government has everybody registered by a unique identifying characteristic, pattern of blood vessels in their eye. This technique, known as iris recognition, is actually in its growth stage today. The future imagined in Minority Report marries the capability of uniquely identifying people through their eye patterns to a small universal scanner that scurries like a spider, tracking, taking the picture of every individual's eye in order to identify them. Because your eye pattern is unique and immutable, the government sees this as a way of conclusively identifying malefactors. Citizens see it as a way of exercising control. This is not the stuff of science fiction. During the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, U.S. forces used iris scanning technology as a sort of digital filing system on civilians and others they encountered. Anderton's fiction is today's reality. The only way for John Anderton, played by the actor Tom Cruise, to avoid this surveillance is to change his eyes. In a rather gruesome scene, he goes through an operation in which eyeballs harvested from a cadaver are transplanted into his eye sockets. That seems pretty extreme to me, <laughs> and it's beyond the realm of possible today, I think. But it gives you a sense of both the power and the peril of biometric identification. So in this lecture, I want to ask, why do we care? What is it about biometrics that make them useful? Then I want to tell you about the technology itself, what it is and how it works. And finally, we'll close with some thoughts about the dark side of the technology, how it might threaten civil liberties. Why biometrics are interesting comes down to the problem of establishing one's identity. If I say to you, my name is Inigo Montoya, how do you know that I'm not Paul Rosenzweig pretending to be Inigo? Well, I am Paul Rosenzweig, but I can show you an identity card with Inigo Montoya's name on it, and maybe even a driver's license or a passport. So how do we verify my identity? The problem came into stark highlight after the September 11 attacks. The government's comprehensive review identified a number of gaps in America's security architecture, including our inability to know who was who. The Florida driver's license picture of Muhammad Atta has become an iconic symbol of the insecurity of our identification apparatus. Misidentification is a critical and endemic problem, and that's why biometrics are increasingly important. In a post-9-11 world, we want to link the biographic information we have available to us about risks associated with an individual, be it risk of financial fraud, abuse of eligibility for benefits, or being a potential terrorist, to a verifiable biometric characteristic that is a physical characteristic that is impossible to change, unless you're Tom Cruise in Minority Report. In every walk of life, as a basic building block of risk assessment, we think it's imperative that we have confidence that people are who they say they are. Consider some of the uses to which a verified biometric identity can be put. Getting through the airport is easier for trusted travelers. Establishing access control checkpoints to let people into buildings and computer systems, or to keep them out. Verifying credit and other consumer behavior, thereby pinpointing or streamlining retail transactions, reducing fraud, and resulting in lower fees. Eliminating voter fraud and ending the voter ID debate. Verifying age and legal authorization to drive or vote or drink alcohol, and so on. Biometrics are actually among the oldest of new technologies. They began with fingerprints early in the 20th century and today include more novel ideas like gate recognition, 
which is the ability to identify an individual by his physical movement. That is, how he or she walks. Now, biometrics can be used in two distinct ways, for verification or for identification. When a biometric system is used to verify whether a person is who he or she claims to be, that verification is frequently referred to as one-to-one -one matching. Almost all systems can determine whether there is a match between a person's presented biometric and a biometric template in a database in less than a second. Identification, by contrast, is known as one-to-many matching. In the one-to-many matching framework, a person's biometric signature, whether it's an iris or a fingerprint, is compared with all the biometric templates within a database. Now, there are also two different types of identification systems for this framework, positive and negative. Positive systems expect there to be a match between the biometric presented and the template. These systems are designed to make sure that a person is in the database. Negative systems are set up the opposite way, to make sure that a person is not in the system. Negative identification can also take the form of a watch list, where a match triggers a notice to the appropriate authority for exclusionary action. Neither system generates perfect matches or exclusionary filters. Instead, each comparison generates a score of how close the presented biometric is to the stored template. The systems compare that score with a predefined number or with algorithms to determine whether the presented biometric and the template are sufficiently close to be considered a match. Most biometric systems therefore require an enrollment process in which a sample biometric is captured, extracted, and encoded as a biometric template. This template is typically then stored in a database against which future comparisons will be made. When the biometric is used for verification, for example, access control, the biometric system confirms the validity of the claimed identity. When used for identification, a biometric technology compares a specific person's biometric with all of the stored biometric records to see if there's a match. For biometric technology to be effective, the database has to be accurate and reasonably comprehensive. The process of enrollment, create, creation of a database, and comparison between the template and the sample is common to all biometrics. That having been said, there are many different forms of biometrics. We're going to talk about four of the most common, fingerprints, iris recognition, facial recognition, and voice recognition. Then we'll mention two other forms of biometrics, hand geometry and gait recognition, and we'll end our description of biometrics with DNA analysis. Fingerprint recognition is probably the most widely used and well-known biometric. Fingerprint recognition relies on features found in the impressions made by the distinct ridges on the fingertips. There are two types of fingerprints, flat and roll. Flat prints are an impression only of the central area of the finger pad, while roll prints capture the ridges on the sides of the finger, as well as the central portion between the tip and the first knuckle. It used to be that fingerprint comparisons were made by hand, with experienced examiners making judgments about matches. Today, fingerprint images are scanned, enhanced, and then converted into templates. These templates are saved in a database for future comparisons using optical, silicon, or ultrasound scanners. In Pakistan, the government requires everyone with a cell phone and SIM card to register with their fingerprints, saying it's an anti-terror initiative, since untraceable, unregistered SIM cards were proliferating as a means of terrorist communication. Another area where fingerprint biometrics have been used is for identity and access management in healthcare, for example, VA or teaching hospitals. Here, the biometric technology is used to solve the challenge of how hospitals can give access to users and yet maintain security levels that provide confidence and comfort to their patients. This is a, a critical challenge since greater security usually decreases access. Using fingerprints has seemed to work as a way of protecting patient privacy without too much inconvenience for the doctors.
Iris recognition technology, as I introduced at the outset, relies on the distinctly colored ring that surrounds the pupil of the eye. Irises have approximately 266 distinctive characteristics, including things like a trabacular meshwork, striations, rings, furrows, a corona, and freckles. Retinal scanning, by contrast, looks at the blood vessel patterns in the iris. So it's the same idea implemented in a slightly different form. For iris recognition, typically more than 170 of the distinctive characteristics are used in creating a template. Irises form during the eighth month of pregnancy, and they're thought to remain stable throughout an individual's life, barring injury. Iris recognition systems usually start with a small camera that takes a picture of the iris. The picture is then analyzed to identify the boundaries of the iris and create a coordinate grid over the image. Then the 170 characteristics found in each different zone are identified and stored in a database as the individual's biometric template. Iris recognition technology is relatively easy to use and can process a large number of people quickly. It's also only minimally intrusive in a physical sense. However, colored or bifocal contact lenses might hinder the effectiveness of the iris recognition system, as can strong eyeglasses. Glare or reflection can also be problematic for the cameras. In addition, oddly enough, people with poor eyesight occasionally have difficulty aligning their eyes correctly with the camera. And people who have glaucoma or cataracts might not be suitable for screening using iris recognition technology. But it is useful. The United Arab Emirates has found iris recognition to be an effective overt security means for preventing expelled foreigners from re-entering the country. The UAE faced a situation in which an expelled foreigner would return to his or her home country and then legally change his or her name, date of birth and address, all descriptors traditionally used to screen individuals entering the country. Since the new identity would not be in any of the traditionally maintained name-dependent lists, government agents would then admit the banned individual to the UAE when he returned. Counter this problem, the small Arab country began developing a biometric system that could be used to scan all individuals arriving in the country and determine whether the person was banned from entering. The UAE's specifications for the system included using a biometric that didn't change over time, could be quickly acquired, was easy to use, could be used in real time, was safe and non-invasive, and which could be scaled into the millions. The Emirates determined that iris recognition technology was the only technology that produced a single-person match in a sufficiently short period of time to meet its needs. According to the country's self-report, the system is remarkably effective. After the first 10 years, the use of iris scans has, they say, prevented the re-entry of 347,019 deportees. A statistical analysis of the, of the program suggests that the likelihood of a false positive match that is, that the system would misidentify someone as registered when they're not, is less than 1 in 80 billion. Face recognition technology identifies individuals by analyzing certain features on their face. You may look at the nose width or the eye sockets or the mouth. Typically, facial recognition compares a live person with a stored template, but it's also been used for comparison between photographs and templates. This technology works for verification and also for identification. Indeed, MasterCard is now in the process of trialing a new facial recognition app for your smartphone that will let you use your face as a way of verifying your identity and approving a credit card transaction. Amusingly, in order to prove that it's a real face taken as a selfie and not a picture, you actually have to blink while the picture is being processed to prove you're alive. In addition, facial recognition is the biometric system that can best be routinely used covertly since a person's face can often be captured by video technology. In other words, you may never know if a photo is being taken of you and compared to some database. And it works. DeepFace, the facial recognition technology developed by Facebook, is said to be 97% accurate 
making it competitive with human distinguishing capabilities. Voice recognition technology identifies people based on vocal differences that are caused either by differences in their physical characteristics, like the shape of their mouth, or from speaking habits, like an accent. Such systems capture samples of a person's speech as scripted information is recorded multiple times into a host record-keeping system. That speech is known as the passphrase. This passphrase is then converted to a digital form and distinctive characteristics like the pitch, cadence, and tone are extracted to create a template for the speaker. Voice recognition technology can be used for both identification and verification. And the use of the technology requires minimal training for those involved. It's also fairly inexpensive and very non-intrusive. The biggest disadvantage with the technology is that it can be unreliable. For instance, it doesn't work well in noisy environments like airports or border entry points. Another form of physical recognition is a measurement based on the human hand and the width, height, and length of the fingers, distances between the joints, and the shape of the knuckles. It's called hand geometry. Using optical cameras and light-emitting diodes that have mirrors and reflectors, two orthogonal, two-dimensional images of the back and the sides of the hand are taken. Based on these images, 96 measurements are calculated and a template is created. Most hand readers have pins to help position the hand po properly. These pins help with consistent hand placement and template repeatability. So there is a low false positive rate and a low failure to accurately match as well. Hand geometry is actually a mature technology, primarily used for high volume time and attendance and access controls. For instance, from donuts to hamburgers, Krispy Kreme and McDonald's alike rely on hand geometry to record staff time and attendance. Hand geometry works particularly well when many people need to be processed in a short period of time, so long as it's one-to-one -one matching. Although people's hands differ, they're not really individually distinct. As a result, hand geometry technology can't be used for the one-to-many matching procedure we discussed a while ago. Hand geometry is perceived as very accurate and has been used in a variety of industries to regulate access controls for more than 30 years. It is useful in identifying who's permitted somewhere or to do something and who is not. It's really very difficult to spoof someone's hand shadow without the person's cooperation. The main advance in the technology over the years has been in cost reduction. Today, a wide variety of places rely on hand geometry for access. The San Francisco airport uses it for access to the tarmac, the port of Rotterdam, Scott Air Force Base, and a sorority at the University of Oklahoma all rely on it. By contrast, gait recognition, which I mentioned earlier, is an emerging biometric technology. It's one that involves people being identified purely through the analysis of the way they walk. According to the Homeland Security News, Scientists in Japan have developed a system measuring how the foot hits and leaves the ground during walking. They then use 3D image processing and a technique called image extraction to analyze the heel strike, roll to forefoot, and push off by the toes. Some say that accuracy and recognition is up to 90%. With the caveat, of course, that if you know you're being watched, you can change your gait. The idea, however, has attracted interest because it's non-invasive and doesn't require the subject's cooperation. Gate recognition can be used from a distance, making it well-suited to identifying perpetrators at a crime scene. Or imagine if we'd been able to see inside bin Laden's hidden Abbottabad house. Perhaps we could have identified him pacing on the rooftop just by his gate. Researchers also envision medical applications for the technology. For example, recognizing changes in walking patterns early on can help identify conditions such as Parkinson's disease and multiple sclerosis in their earliest stages. DNA analysis is perhaps the most accurate biometric method of one-to-one -one identity verification. You'll likely recall what happened to Bill Clinton 
after Monica Lewinsky turned over a navy blue dress that she said she had worn during a romantic encounter with the president. Investigators compared the DNA in a stain on that dress to a blood sample from the president. By conducting the two standard DNA comparisons, the FBI laboratory concluded that Bill Clinton was the source of the DNA obtained from Monica Lewinsky's dress. According to the more sensitive RFLP test, referring to restriction fragment length polymorphism, used by molecular biologists to follow a particular sequence of DNA as it's passed on to other cells, the genetic markers contained in Mr. Clinton's DNA are characteristic of one out of 7.87 trillion Caucasians. Of course, on the flip side, DNA evidence has increasingly come to be used to exonerate the wrongly accused and convicted. Hundreds of such cases have been overturned, at least 20 of which involve people who had served time on death row. So, biometrics are great. What could possibly go wrong? The answer rests with whether or not we're comfortable with the government having an immutable record of who we are and what we do. One development in recent years that troubled some civil liberties advocates was the case Maryland versus King, which was decided by the Supreme Court in 2013. The case asked the question of whether and when the government could forcibly collect your DNA from you. In general, authorities can collect DNA from people convicted of crimes. But if, what if you are merely arrested and not yet convicted? The Supreme Court by a narrow five to four majority, said that the administrative collection of DNA from all arrestees was permissible, even in the absence of a warrant or probable cause. The dissent in that case was vehement, essentially asking what happened to the rule of innocent until proven guilty. Of course, your DNA is everywhere you are and remains through shedding after you go. With the result in the King case, the government is now free to assemble a template DNA national database of anyone who's ever been arrested for a crime. The best estimate I've seen suggests that the database may, in the end, connect, contain the DNA of one in four Americans, with a significantly higher rate for African Americans. Not all of the samples were collected for criminal reasons, of course, but many were. And all of this suggests that the use of biometric technologies poses a host of interrelated policy questions. Some of the questions one might ask are, can the biometric system be narrowly tailored to its task? Who will oversee the program? What alternatives are there to biometric technologies? What information will be stored and in what form? Other questions. To what facility or location will the biometric give access? Will the original biometric material be retained? Will biometric data be kept separately from other identifying personal information? Who will have access to the information? How will access to the information be controlled? How will the system ensure accuracy? Will data be aggregated across databases? If data is stored in a database, how will it be protected? Who will make sure that the program administrators are responsive to privacy concerns? Can people remove themselves from a database voluntarily? In effect, can they unenroll? How will consistency between data collected at multiple sites be maintained? If there's a choice, will people be informed of optional versus mandatory enrollment alternatives? Some of the fears surrounding biometric information include that it be gathered without permission knowledge, or clearly defined reasons, used for a multitude of purposes other than the one for which it was initially gathered, you know, function creep, disseminated to others without explicit permission, used to help create a complete picture about people for surveillance or social control purposes. There are also concerns about tracking, which is real-time or near real-time surveillance of an individual, and profiling, where a person's past activities are reconstructed, both of these would effectively destroy a person's anonymity. So, here are some ideas about biometrics to consider. 
enrollment in biometric systems should generally be overt instead of covert. Before one is enrolled in a biometric program, one should probably be made aware of that enrollment. Thus, we should be more skeptical of government-run biometric programs such as public facial recognition that permit the surreptitious capture of biometric data. Biometric systems are better used for verification than identification. In general, that is, they're better suited for a one-to-one -one match, assuring that the individual in question is who he says he is and has the requisite authorization to engage in the activity in question. Biometrics are both less practically useful and more problematic as a matter of policy when they're used in a one-to-many fashion to pierce an individual's anonymity without the justification inherent in, for example, seeking access to a particular location. We should prefer biometric systems that are opt-in and require a person's consent rather than those that are mandatory. By this, we should not mean that requiring one to opt-in cannot be made a condition of participation. For example, if you want to enter the United States, you must provide a biometric, since participation is ultimately voluntary in some way. And we also recognize that certain biometric applications, like DNA for convicted criminals, may need to be mandatory. Again, however, this should be an exception to the general rule of voluntariness. Any biometric system we build should have a strong audit and oversight program to prevent misuse. Someone must, as we've said before, watch the watchers. And finally, we need to be concerned about the security of a biometric database. After all, if your password or credit card number gets hacked, you can change it. It's inconvenient and costly to be sure, but it can be done. If your biometric data gets hacked, as happened to many government employees in the breach of the Office of Personnel Management Security Database, there is much more trouble afoot. You can't, after all, change your fingerprint. Centralized storage of biometric data also raises privacy concerns by tending to enable easier mission creep. Clearly, for some technologies and applications, local storage won't be feasible. But to the extent it's practicable, local storage should be preferred. But all this pales next to the larger question of who gets to decide? Should citizens have a right to control their extremely sensitive biometric data? Should, for example, the collection of facial biometrics on a public way be impermissible? In one sense, the answer seems like it should be obvious. If I can take a picture of you on the street without your permission, which I can, just go on the street and take a shot, why can't the government? On the other hand, well, it's the government. Today, however, the decision to move forward with biometrics is not really the subject of wide public debate. In 2014, the FBI started to use a next-generation identification biometric database with 14 million face images. Current plans are to increase that number to 52 million images by 2015, with more images to be collected in the future. Some communities are even issuing mobile biometric readers to their governmental staff. The staff, usually police officers, but sometimes other regulatory agents, can take pictures of people on the street or in their homes and immediately identify them and enroll them in face recognition databases. Biometric technologies are likely to be of great value in creating secure identification. But to be useful and acceptable, they need to be privacy and civil liberties neutral. They can and should be designed with appropriate protocols to ensure privacy before they're implemented. On that, perhaps we all can agree.